Welcome to the 2020 Celebration of Achievement Awards. Usually, we're all, we're all in the hall celebrating the, the awards to be given out. Unfortunately, with COVID as the pandemic, we're gonna to have to do that virtually. And today, I was lucky enough to meet with Tom Webster, the chairman of Seaford Town, an old boy of the school, and we discussed how he's got to, what he, how he's got to where he is, what it's, what it's like, how much he's putting back into the community, We'll talk about that segue after we've done some awards. So we have Key Stage 3, 4 and 5 awards. We'll then cut to Tom Webster, as I saw him earlier today. And then after there, we have our top achievers in each of the year groups and our special awards to, to round up and then a little closing statement from myself. Now we come to the Key Stage 3, 4 and 5 awards listed Afterwards are those subject awards for English, maths, drama, psychology, all of the subjects within Key Stage 3, 4 and 5. There'll be two students listed for each award and your name could be on there. This afternoon, I was lucky enough to meet with Tom Webster. Tom's an ex old boy of the school. He left in 2005. Now, most of you, some of you weren't even born in 2005, and he left to become a local businessman, a young entrepreneur. Only recently, he's taken on the chairmanship of Seaford Town Football Club and been involved with a number of different opportunities, helping out in the community and developing the football club. And he's got a great vision and foresight into how and what he's going to do. So here's the clip with myself and Tom chatting this afternoon. Just to start with, I'll introduce you, you're Tom Webster. 
ex-student of Superdeo, when did you leave? It must have been 2005, 2006-ish. And what, where did you, did you go to the sixth form? Did you? I did, so I did the full, I joined at year seven, it was the year 2000, so like millennial student, um, all the way through from GCSEs and then into sixth form, I did both years in the sixth form. And then, how did you find that? Was it difficult, was it tough? Uh, no, it wasn't. To be, to be fair, like, I really enjoyed it. There's was, there was bits of it, this school's school at the end of the day, and, and as a kid, you're like, I want to be out, I want to grow up, I want to go and do stuff. But I did enjoy it. There was, I had a good bunch of mates, obviously playing football, enjoying sort of like the sport aspect of everything. Um, I think I always knew that I wasn't, I wasn't built for education, so I was built to go and work, and I always wanted mm. to make money and go and achieve something. Um, but now, looking back now, I actually enjoy learning more now than I did back then. So now I've got like a real first for knowledge and it's like, I always wish I could switch it around. So with, with that, obviously you enjoyed school. Did you do well academically or? I th I'm probably the biggest Joe average. So everything was okay. So my GCSEs were actually all right. I think it was like three, no, three Bs, five Cs, two Ds and an E. So I still remember it because it almost rhymes. Yeah. <laughs> and, and then when I got to sixth form, I didn't do particularly well at sixth form. I think I got a C and two Ds at A level. That's, st that's still decent, C and two Ds at, yeah, at A level. Yeah, it was one of those things. I think when, I, when I, I thought I'd done pretty well at GCSEs, so I thought, well, I'll go and carry on and do sixth form because I thought I'd done better than I anticipated. And then when I got to sixth form, that was when I was really then more clucking for a bit more freedom and saying, actually, I want to go out and I want to try yeah. and do something myself. So I didn't really apply myself as much as I should have or how much actually, it's one of those things, it, hindsight's wonderful, but looking back, I really do wish I would have applied myself more um, because the, the way I look at it now is like I had that time, I can't do anything. I can't go and do anything else. I have to be there. Mm. So I might as well have done the best I could, but I didn't and I would have liked to have gone back and said, actually, do you know what? I just should have just applied myself because I'm here. I might as well just do the best I can at the situation I've got. Cool. Um, when you got your, your A-level grades, what did you then, what was, what was your calling? What did, what did you come out and you go, do you know what, what am I going to do? Or did you just go, right, I'm going to go travelling, or I'm going to do this, I'm going to go to yeah. uni, what, what happened? So I was lost, if I'm completely honest. I sort of got to that and, then, and it sort of caught up with me that now I've got to make some decisions and I've got to say, right, am I going to go and go and find a job? Am I going to go travelling? Like I said, I'm going to go to university. And I don't... My, my grades weren't quite good enough for me to feel confident enough to go into university. I didn't, I didn't, and I didn't feel like I knew, I didn't have that one thing. I was like, that's what I want. I don't want to be a doctor. I don't want to be a lawyer. I don't want to be a teacher. I don't, that's like, I, I don't want that university education. And I didn't want to just go to university for university's sake, because I think that can happen. I think you can mm. just think that that's the option. So then you just default to just, just go into it. So I sort of come out of sixth form and I said to myself, oh, well, I'll go find myself a job. And, and I remember, I, I actually remember it. I was, I was passing CVs around the town just in like estate agents and all that sort of stuff and so we've got one day of job hunting and I'm in uh, Morrison's and I'm doing a bit of just shopping for lunch and my dad rings me and he's like you found a job yet <laughs> I was like, I've only been doing it for the morning and he's like well you, I need you to come in and, and work for me and I was like I'll come and help you but I, I want to go and do my own thing what was that what? So, so my dad at the time so he sat in between mortgage brokers and mortgage lenders doing the admin and the processing and so it's like not the particularly most exciting or rock and roll industry and not really where I ever saw myself. I said, well, I'll come in, I'll come and help and I'll, and I'll do my bit. And then, yeah, about six le years later, I'm still there. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I never really got the opportunity to really think to myself, what do I want to be? What do I want to do? So my whole life has mainly been taking the opportunities as they come. So, so what are you currently doing? So at the moment, uh, I run a company called Century Advice. So again, mortgages, there was a gap where I'd come out of the mortgage industry and then, then come back in, which I, I suppose we'll talk about. But yeah, so I run a company called Century Advice, which is predominantly mortgage advice. Um, and then I also do some property investing, have a property podcast. Um, I run, well, I'm the chairman at Seaford Town Football Club, which is where we are today. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> if, if this wasn't a big giveaway. <laughs> um, and then I'm also, I invest in a couple of other bits. So there's a friend of mine that I've invested in a, um, an indoor football facility up in Norwich. And I, the dream is to do something similar down this way as well. So yeah, a little bit of this, a little bit of that. Excellent. So you've been busy. Yeah. <laughs> and obviously from where, where, where you were to where, where you are now, Hard work, luck, intelligence, what? A bit of everything, definitely a mix, mix of all of it. I think, I don't, I'm probably not working as hard right now. COVID's kind of put a bit of a damper on a couple of the things that I wanted to do. So it's a little bit biding my time and a, a bit of education and get myself ready to really hit the, the ground hard next year. But in the early days, a lot of hard work. 
So when I was working for my dad, so I had that typical chip on my shoulder working for my dad, had to be better than everybody else because I didn't want people just to think I've got given the job because I work for my dad. Mm. Um, so I always make sure that I was the first one in, last one out. Um, didn't take me too long to become sort of like the top salesperson there. And I do genuinely believe that was all through hard work and grit is, is I was up silly o'clock in the morning and leaving silly o'clock in the mm. evening. Um, but then, I, and then I, luck's a funny thing because I think I do actually, or people, they all take the mickey because I'm probably the luckiest person in the world. <laughs> and like, I, I win every raffle and I win <laughs> to, to the point that I've even, I was sat in, in a raffle and I've gone, I'm going to win the next prize and the next prize has come out. And it, so, so there is luck. But then I also do believe you create your own luck. I think you put yourself in, you, you say yes to opportunities and you put yourself in positions and you have conversations and you open doors. And funny enough, luck does seem to follow. I think that with education, it's, it's about opening doors. So GCSEs open doors to the, your options at, at A level, and A level then op- gives you opportunities whether you want to go continue with academics or, or, or get into the world of work. So I think the academic side, all that, those, it's all about giving yourself those opportunities. And with what you're doing now, not in terms of business, but in terms of C for Town, can you talk us just sort of talk us through that a little bit? Yeah, yeah, of course. So again, opportunity knock. So a friend of mine um, plays for Seaford Town Football Club and we're out having a few drinks and having a good night and he said um, that they're looking for a chairman. And I had no intention. How old were you then? Uh, this was two years ago, so I was 31. Quite young. For a chairman, yeah, massively young. I think most chairmen are probably retired. And it's probably a better job for a retired person, to be honest, because <laughs> the amount of hours it takes. Um, but I think, I'm, again, I'm in that fortunate position where the business is in a place where it is and the property is stuff's doing what it's doing that I have a little bit of extra time to be able to indulge in community projects as it were um, but yeah a bit of an opportunity knock so so we was having a drink he said do you want to do it and I was like no no way there's no chance I've, I haven't got the time um, a few more drinks later and he was like oh, actually yeah maybe maybe I could do something here and then um, and then Karen from the football club rang me up and said oh he said you're interested <laughs> okay well I'll come down and then and we had this conversation and there was explaining sort of the things they needed around the club and, and, and where they'd got to and, and what they wanted for the next stage and I just felt like you know I can help here and 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 that's probably a character trait of mine that I've always had that in me if someone needs help and I think that I can do something to help I'm, I'm quite quick to say yes um, and that that comes with anything like favours like if anyone needs a favour I'm more than happy to give a favour but then I'm also really confident to ask for a favour and I think that all comes round and again that comes down to that well, yeah, luck th- creation. I think in terms of the kids at school and, and the kids that, that we deal with day in day out some of them are really would really struggle with asking for help and yeah. I think obviously it's okay all the all the things it's okay to not be okay and, and that but kids just like I just need some help. It's, do you know, it's, the, it's, it's, the, it's a superpower. To be able to ask for help from someone is a superpower. And it, it, it's one of those things, people are scared of rejection, but I've always been a bit of a numbers game and, and you might get knocked back a hundred times, but you only need one yes. So, yeah. and, and, and by asking for help and be out there and, and be prepared to be helpful for other people. And it, most people are good. I mean, I've always said that, like 99% of people on this planet are good and want to do good and are more than happy to help. And if you were to, to knock on someone's door and say, I, I want this and I need this for this reason, more, more often than not, someone's going, oh, yeah, of course, I'd do my best. But then be that person for someone else as well. If mm. someone knocks on your door and says, I need help, you're, most people are going to say yes. And if you've, got, you've got to put yourself in other people's shoes. Most people are going to be similar to you. And I think the vast majority of people out there would like to help somebody. Mm. So, Seaford Town, what... Name a couple of things that you've done that you're really proud of. How long have you got? <laughs> <laughs> but this fence. This yeah. Fence. <laughs> so the, the first thing we did, so when I, when I first took over, we had uh, like a Hornet logo, which looked like it was on clip art and the brand of the club wasn't really modernised and it had, its, it had a story and it had its history. But my first step was to really say, actually, I, I want to give the club a brand that you can feel passionate about and then the town can then get behind it because it feels like it represents them. So I used the company called, again, talking about asking for favours. So a guy called Luke Taylor, who's a friend of mine or I do a lot of business with, um, when I took over the football club, he was the first person I rung and said, look, look I need a favour. Mm. I'm taking over the football club. We've got absolutely no money. It doesn't, it doesn't generate enough money to pay for your services. And he's working with companies like the PGA and um, like Fujitsu and, and uh, I was at Lego. So he's doing all these brands for these massive companies. And then we've got this small football club that says, can, can we use your help? He says, yes. He says, I'd love to. I live in Seaford. I'd like to do more for the community and, and help. And they've created this incredible brand that resonates throughout the whole club. So that means that we can then change the kit so then the players then feel more comfortable in the kit. The stuff we're doing with the youth side. So we just 
just brought in a, a new youth mascot, so we've got Planksy the Seal. I've, I have seen Planksy the Seal on Twitter. <laughs> so again, it, it, is it Ben Dartnell? It's not Ben Dartnell, but it might be Ben Dartnell at some point. Only if he's injured, surely he's yeah. on the pitch. Actually, to be fair, we've got a match tonight and he is injured and I might bring him down. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, so, and, and doing stuff with the youth, so again, making them feel like they've got a pathway to senior football. Um, and I just want people just to enjoy it. And we've had our, intended, our attendances have increased. We've spent loads of money on the actual clubhouse itself. We've renovated the changing rooms. Um, more of a social media push to just doing as much as we can there. Because the whole point of it is if we can engage the community, then the community can give back to us as much as we can give back to them. Um, and everything's that relationship building. And it's, again, asking for favours here and there. Like we needed a new um, mower for the, for the pitch um, to, to roll it because it's really bobby. So this is probably one of the worst pitches in the county and it's a nightmare. But we can only do so much of what we can do. So then we go to the community and say we need to raise money for a new mower and the community gets behind it. But then we then do stuff for the community in, re in reverse yeah. for the charity stuff that we do. So, so you s mentioned about the charity stuff. Um, I saw that you made your sort of talk sport debut. <laughs> what happened? So we jumped on the Marcus Rashford uh, free school meals campaign. So again, massive on, on, on Twitter and, and social media. And as soon as I saw it, I just thought this is something that we can get behind. You got, you got a, a prolific footballer who's doing incredible stuff and he's well on his way for a knighthood. I think he's doing mm. like amazing, amazing um, example he's setting. And I just thought, you know, there's this something we can do. And I'd seen a couple of restaurants uh, dotted around and I do actually be we were the first football club in the country to say we can do something. And again, where we're all volunteer based and it's all non-profit, everything that we do, we don't, we, we don't have a lot of money in the bank. But the money we do have, if we can do good with it, let's do something good with it. So, so we put it on social media and, and Marcus Rashford retweeted it and then it went viral and it went viral locally through all like the Seaford notice boards mm. and all the, the bits and bobs on Facebook and stuff. Um, and then we had quite a few people get in touch saying, can we donate, can we get involved? And we were just going to do it all off our own back. So it was like, okay, fantastic. So we set up a GoFundMe page. In the end, we were just shy of five grand we'd raised. And, and we was like, wow. So, but where this momentum had, had gathered, I think then TalkSport then got in touch, said, can we put you on? We had ITV News come down. Um, but again, it goes back to what you're saying about doing favors and, and helping people. We've, great, we've, we've massively raised our profile in the town by doing something positive. Um, so then if something in the future comes up and we need help from the community, then it's a reciprocal. reciprocal. Yeah. yeah. So how many, how many meals? So I think we did 80 meals over the week. Um, we, we learned a lot of lessons. So the first thing we did is we thought that people would just come and, and we had like loads of food down here ready for people to take takeaways. And it was not the best weather. And, and I think some people, rightly or wrongly, they, they, they might feel a bit embarrassed to come down here so, and, and obviously take it what they would perceive as charity. We didn't look at it like that way. We just wanted to feed people and just make sure people were, and again, going back to, they shouldn't be mm. scared to ask for help. Um, but we then set up the takeaway system as well. So we were doing deliveries in town and, and dropping food around. And there were some families that had like four or five kids. Um, and we did the whole week. So you're thinking like that's, that's, that's a lot of mouths to feed for some yeah. parents. And since then, so the lessons that we learned, we want to we want to get straight to the parents. So we've done it all on social media, but we're going to now work with the schools to get through to the parents. Um, and I, I can't remember the number off the top of my head, but it's something like 450 kids in Seaford are on free school meals. So our goal is to obviously help all of those families. Um, and then what we're going to do, because we, we raised so much money, we've actually raised more money than we needed for the, yeah. the half term, is what positive can we do with that? So we want to make sure that every penny of that does go directly into feeding um, kids on free school meals. So we've set up what we've called the Seaford Town Community Sport Foundation. Nice little mouthful. <laughs> <laughs> um, but the idea behind that is we want to be doing lunch clubs. So rather than it just being come and get some food or we'll still do the deliveries but what we want to do is have a free lunch club so kids well, of during the holidays during the holidays <coughs> yeah so kids of low income families can come and enjoy football we want to work with the rugby club the cricket club etc and maybe do one each and use this money to, to cover the town but then kids can get an hour of sport a nutritious meal um and then and then we can carry that through christmas easters all the half terms so there's plenty of money there to, to run a scheme like that for a while fantastic <coughs> why would you do that What's, what, why would we? Yeah, why, why would you do that? Because that's obviously pe people get in, involved in it. And well, it, the, the, the obvious answer is because it's a nice thing to do. Yeah. <laughs> and it is nice to do nice things. It does feel good. There is a selfish element of it. It does feel great to, to do something for charity and to, and to help people. And then, and then from another selfish point of view, it does the club the world of good. Um, not, not embarrassed to say it, but if we, like I said, if we're doing more for the community, then the community will do more for us and we can grow together and we can all help each other out. 
But, but at the end of the day, I think I was really touched by the thought that there are children out there that might not have a meal in a day. Yeah. And we live in a country that has plenty. You know, we, the, the supermarkets throw food out left, right and centre. And it just it's beyond me that anyone in this country can go without food. And I think, I think you see the rise in food bank usage and all the sort of things like that. And again, we're working with the local food bank for any sort of overspill that we've got and, and helping them out. Um, but it's just the right thing to do. And, 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 the more, and the more that we can do to help the community, then, then, then that, that, that's, our, that's our place. I think football clubs are more than just playing football. Mm. I think we've got 300 kids that play for our youth, youth side. And it would kill me to know that one of those kids wasn't eating in a day or eating for the week. Um, and then I feel a sense of responsibility over those kids as much as, as everyone in the town. Um, but yeah, to do, to do more, the, the most we can. Yeah, So and then you've got, obviously I've seen it, you've got your community card, which is now an app. It is, yeah. <laughs> so, so yeah, so we set up a scheme. Again, this was pre-COVID was the plan and then COVID sort of put a bit of a bump in the road and then relaunched it again as things have calmed down a little bit. But the idea was that businesses offer discounts to card holders and then we can then improve the relationship between consumers in Seaford and retailers in Seaford because a lot of people might do their, their shopping online or they might go to the big big stores out of town or they might go into Brighton but the person that owns the shop in Seaford Town High Street that's, that could be your next door neighbour and every customer to them is just as important as the last so the better that we can build the relationship between the two and again being the standing that we've got in the town I thought we were the best place position to be able to offer something like that um, but then it also raises good funds for the club so we charge 25 pounds for the card it's thousands of pounds worth of discounts over a year that someone can make but the club makes 25 quid for everyone we sell and and the maths hasn't we haven't quite made made as much money as we'd like to on it it's, it's still a growing project but if there's 30,000 people in Seaford and we get 1,000 by the card it's 25 grand uh, 25 grand down here will do the wonders yeah. So, so that's the goal is to, to build that up. And then because it's annually, if we could get a thousand people every year buying this card and we, in, we inject 25,000 pounds into the club, fantastic. And yeah. then we also put a pound uh, for every card side, we put a pound into local good causes as well. So we're going to distribute that. So every time we reach 100 cards sold, we then give 100 quid to a local cause or, mm. or charity. No, it's, it's absolutely fantastic. And I, obviously, I've been involved in a number of sports clubs throughout my time and, and I see that there is a growth. I see that there is a plan. I see that it's not just about, it's not just about the results on the pitch, which, yeah. which would- <laughs> Don't talk about that one. <laughs> <laughs> which, would be, which would be the icing on the cake. Yeah. But actually all those things in terms of growing a sports club are what you need to do in order to, for that pyramid to rise, that, the icing on the cake to, to, to be there. And it's certainly from my point of view and the kids that come through, the kids that come through the school are really proud of playing for Seaford Town, more so now than say 10, 15 years ago. Um, a lot of those better players would go and play somewhere else. Whereas they're now sort of staying in and around Seaford because obviously within your cohort of friends and, and your sort of era, your, your peers, there's some, excellent footballers that are still plying their trade yeah. on, on in and around in and around the, the ground um what you got one of your managers is yeah an, ec, an a, alumni of the school and and that's that community spirit is that Seaford has 30,000 residents but their football team is in comparison to to other 30,000 towns is, is where you can go so so what is the vision I really want us to be a Ryman's club I think I think two two more leagues up and and we're sort of bordering on the line. Of How are you going to get there? Doing what we're doing. It, it's like I said, it's exactly that. Like, it's a pyramid. Is we need to build the basis to be. To, what we could do is we could throw loads of money at players and say we'll pay you high wages and get players in from leagues above to come and play for Seaford and get us up there straight away. But that's that's a you're building a house of cards. Mm. The, the, that will topple because you can't just sustain longevity of the football club by just paying players loads of money. So the idea is that if we can build the club to be strong enough to grow itself to that position where you can then pay the players loads of money through our own efforts and our own revenues. So, so yes, yeah, so it's a long, it's a long term project. I would have liked to have been gunning for promotion this year and then, then maybe knocking on the door for Rhymes over the next sort of three or four. Uh, the results aren't quite going our way, <laughs> but, <laughs> so it might be a bit of a longer term project, but, but, the, but the stuff we're doing, I think it is the basis of things that can come. 
like I said, like the silly things like re renovating the change room. So you've got this change room that's been there since my dad used to play. And I, I remember, and that's like the history of my club. I used to come down here and watch my dad play football. So I was like four or five years old playing football on the sidelines. I don't even remember going into the change room and the smell of deep heat still comes. That is, <laughs> the, the minute I smell deep oh. heat, all I can think about is in that change room. And, and they're still exactly the same. So they haven't been changed in all that time. And, and the world's moved on. People expect more and, and want more. So by spending 500 quid to make the changing rooms oh, nice. I've seen them. They're, they're, we'll see what we can do if we can get a, a clip of them inside. Yeah. They're, they are first rate, yeah. standard. It, obviously, if you go to Man City, everything's... Oh, we're not the, far it, off. <laughs> the, it's the size. You've only got a limited, yeah, yeah, yeah. limited As good footprint. as it can be, yeah. It's as good as it... With the size it is, you've got your little compartments, for little cubicles for the players. Yeah. They can keep their valuables and they keep everything safe. You've got a little bit of AstroTurf indoors, freshly painted, a little bit of motivational quotes. It looks absolutely fantastic. And I think, you, from what I would suggest, everything is moving in that way. So you get everything in place for it to be as professional as it possibly can be. Yeah. In order, exactly to, that. in order to grow. And, we're try, and we're trying to jump the level up. So when I took it over, it was the standard that we are. It's about right. It was about, okay, but I don't want it to be that. I want it to be something bigger. And I think that the committee and everyone that's involved with the football club wants it to be more and knows it can be more. And you've hit the nail on the head in regards to the population size. The football club versus the size of the town is completely disproportionate. Um, and I want to give the club, I want to give the town a club the size of the town and something that you can get behind. Um, and, and exactly like you said, so in, when we're talking about asking for favours, so even the, the change room itself, so we got a discount on the woodwork because we asked for a favour and we said we'll give you some sponsorship in return. Um, the actual carpentry was done by um, Hartwood uh, Carpen uh, Carpentry, did it for free. He's a player at the Vets and, and we asked him for a favour and he said, yeah, I'll do it over two days and he, he, he put it all together. I painted it, Wisey painted it, um, and, and one of the other coaches painted it. So again, when you talk about community effort, just one tiny little thing that feels really insignificant to some, the changing room. Now when these players turn up, and tonight's gonna to be their first night playing from out of that changing room in, in a competitive game, they're gonna turn up feeling better than they would have felt before. Because mm. you, you go into a cold, damp, dated, hasn't been painted in years changing room, your mindset is instantly not where it needs to be. But all of a sudden, if you feel professional, and you feel like actually, do you know what, we, we have got an advantage here. Even if it's that tiny percent, we know in sport everything is inches and if you can go out there and just win that extra inch, that, that was the idea yeah. behind it. Well, that's, and it, I think when you look at sort of school and education, you, you touched on it right at the very start, actually, you're here. You're, you're here, why not make it the best possible opportunity you have in order to make it the best possible, in, in your case, product, footballing product, but regarding that students' education is all about striving. It doesn't matter where you start from. It's matter how do you get to where you're going. And it comes down to hard work. And I'm sure you spend, in relation to your business, far too much time. <laughs> if, you're, if you're purely business orientated, far too much time dealing with the minutiae of making sure that somebody's to serve tea on a Saturday afternoon or, or this evening, making sure that everything's COVID secure, making sure all your paperwork's in place. You wouldn't, you wouldn't do it. No, no, you, you, can, you can, everything is how much you want to put into it. And I could have quite easily have taken over the chairman role and kept the ship steady and just rode it and kept it as it is and just it be what it is. But I wouldn't have been fulfilled with that. And, it's this, and the same when I look back at school is I'm not particularly fulfilled with how much effort I put in, especially in sixth form, is, is I put enough in just to get by Whereas I said, like, I'm there, I might as well do the, do the best I can. And, I, and it, it would have been interesting to go back and say, if I would have applied myself to that, that, that high level that I do now, how far would I have gone with education? But I, think you, I think the lessons you learn over age and the, you, you sort of, you develop as a person. And, <laughs> and, and, it, and it is difficult, because I remember my kids, uh, my kids, my parents saying to me when I was a kid, like, the school's the best time of your life. You're like, it ain't. There's no way, is it? I'm bored. I'm <laughs> everything's, go yeah. everything's going downhill yeah. from here. <laughs> and then, and then you leave school, and you're like, oh, why am I not back? And, and, and again, you, everyone's life's like obviously the we're all a star of our own show and stuff, and, and you can only do what you can do. But at school, if you like, if I would have applied myself, might be might be a different game. But you can do what you do. Yeah. What message would you give to all those twelve hundred and or so students that we've got 
from year seven through to the sixth form, what message would you give them? The, the, again, I say the biggest thing, again, this conversation pretty much sums it up is ask for help, is don't be embarrassed to ask for help, take risks. Is, is I'm, I, I consider myself a relatively big risk taker, um, calculated risk, I fail more times than I ever succeed by, by a long shot, if, it, if it's 10 to one or failure to wins, mm. but you only need one win. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, it, take risks and and work hard. Is like, like I said, you're there. Got, yeah. You got you 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 can't you can't leave. You can't do anything else. So you might as well just do the absolute best you can because it doesn't last forever. You're not you're not going to be stuck at school forever. Which at the time it does feel like that. It, that you, every day does. Every day <laughs> is another day, and you think, oh my god, I'm never going to escape this place. But but you can't do anything else. So you might as well just do the absolute best you can. But yeah, I think that the biggest one is is definitely feel confident asking for favours and and and, w and when you when you're sort of of that age people are more susceptible to, to help because like as I was I was considered like a young entrepreneur and, and I was trying to do th new things and when you knock on someone's door send them a message on LinkedIn or send them a tweet and say oh I'm, I'm 16 years old and I'm thinking about doing this people love that people love the fact because they love that energy and and there'd be many there'd be so many kids out there that will have these fantastic ideas and feel like they, they're not ready, they're too young or whatever, start asking and, 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 and talking about it. And I've, we say this in the podcast as well, and it's like, well, like manifestation. It's you, you manifest things that you talk about. So if you've got an idea in your head, go and tell your friends it. They might take, take the mickey or whatever, but you just keep talking about it. And if you think it's good enough and you keep going, and, and eventually the stars will align and things will just start to, to form. Um, it was actually it was a lady that used to work for us, and she... Um, she must have been like 60 odd um, plodding along but she had a really good sales tactic that she would do and like if she had to sell more insurance like she wasn't hitting her bonus or something what she would do is if someone would ask her like in the street like when you bump into oh, how are you how, how's things you're like yeah no I'm doing really well I'm selling loads of insurance <laughs> and just start that conversation but what, what that leads to is she was manifesting more sales in insurance because she was talking about insurance. Yeah. Whereas very easy at that point in the conversation to go, yeah, no, I'm really well, how are you? But, but it's that getting yourself out there, that's, the, that's a big one. Because a lot of people can hide behind a computer screen, can hide behind um, sort of their own maybe insecurities or feeling they're not ready or don't know enough. Just go and just do it. Just take the risks and, and feel confident in yourself that, that even if a million people say no, you only need one person to say yes. Cool. Excellent. It's been an absolute pleasure to catch up with you. No, thank you so much. Absolute pleasure. Um, everything's in the right place for this to, to sort of skyrocket. Obviously, we can, we'll do whatever we possibly can in trying to, trying to coach those youngsters, obviously, in, in the school situation to, to give them more and more opportunities. And if we can link up or, or do something between Seaford Town and, and Seaford Head School, that would be absolutely fantastic. Yeah, that would be I'm brilliant. sure we can sort of broach that. But... Absolutely fantastic, thank you. No, thank you, thank you very much. Welcome back. Tom, Tom's led a young life of 32 years old, his own business, and he's worked hard to get there from his, from his roots, working for his father, and now what he's doing, giving back to the community in Seaford Town. Some great advice there about you being in school, some great advice about when you leave school, some great sort of life uh, advice as well. We have the top achievers. What we have is we have the top 10 achievers in each of the year groups. They were listed seven through to 11, and they'll be here now. The first special award, the first special award is the Sylvie Kobolak Award for Outstanding Progress in Languages. It generally is a key stage four award and for this award we have a year 10 student who has been nominated by the languages department and that student is 
Ellie Stone. Next one. We now have the Trish Jenkins Award for service to the community. Trish was a, a member of staff here who worked in the kitchens and in the cleaning staff who worked tirelessly to provide and support the children of this school. This award for the services to the community this year goes to James Jenkins. The third award is the Sue Skelton Award for Outstanding Progress in Maths. Sue was a 20-year veteran of Seaford Head, working in the maths department of being head of maths, and still occasionally you might see her working, doing some one-to-ones. Sue's, the Sue Skelton Award for Maths goes to Helena Tran. The Mayor's Cup for Endeavour, an award which highlights those students who struggle, who overcome that, and work hard throughout their school career, both inside of lessons and outside of lessons. And this young person who wins the Mayor's Cup for Endeavour is Dayan Prescott. The last award is the Tom, Cor Tom Carter Memorial Award for the Performing Arts. Now, Tom was a student here until, unfortunately, he passed away shortly after his time here. He was heavily into his performing arts, performing in the, the orchestra and the musicals. And the Tom Carter Memorial Award for the Performing Arts goes to Holly Vandell. That concludes this special awards. Thank you for watching. Thank you for listening. Thank you for all of the hard work. If you're an award winner for the awards in 2020, it will own, hard work will get you everywhere you need to go. So make sure that you continue to work hard, make progress, but ultimately be kind and be nice. And all those things that you aspire to be will come to you in the end. Thank you very much. And that concludes the 2020 Celebration of Achievement Awards. Thank you. Bye-bye.